Hello, my name is Noah Moore from Penn Highlands High School in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, and my new research capstone project dealt with bilingual um, pedagogy, um, deal effects, and subsequent elucidations that deal with that problem. Um, so in simpler terms, it deals with um, learning methods experienced by um, English language learners and foreign students within the kind of bilingual edu educational system we have in America today. So to begin, um, I have some stats. So the number of ELLs, which is kind of a simpler um, umbrella term for English language learners, someone, a uh, foreign student who's coming to learn English, um, regardless of where their um, foreign origin is. In 2002, 2003, 4.1 million students, about 3 to 4.4 million um, when compared to 2011 and 2012. So it's obviously on a steady increase, so it's definitely an issue of prominence within our society today, especially in America. Um, with regards to their um, educational quality or um, how well they're doing in school, he also consistently fair works on tests of uh, academic achievement and peers who have never been um, English language learners, or who have never, so they always do worse than people who actually speak English in similar terms. The margin to 29 to 49%, um, just kind of illustrated in that is bars right there, according to Molly Faulkner Bond. Um, and also just kind of a overall fact of the prominence of uh, foreign languages within one in five American people speak a foreign language, um, which is a record high globally of 61.8 million, or a record high based on American history of 61.8 million, according to the Center of Immigration Studies. So, um, although many argue that studying a foreign language in high school um, might not be important or might not kind of um, help you with that student life, it's obviously something that is not rare to find in America with up to 20% of the population being by more sad. The average ESL test score composition over time, as you can see, um, this is through an experiment, so uh, observations within the bilingual educative environment in schools. So this was when they didn't speak English and they were learning in an English environment, but as you integrate English and Spanish, if you're talking about Spanish students, um, slowly their scores will become more high because they're learning a language that they're more familiar with, along with learning more English, which is important if they're living in America, as it's one of the most widely spoken languages. Also, the Hispanic population is definitely on the rise of 15%. Um, it makes up 15% of the population now. You can see that Hispanic is the blue line. So just um, recently, in like 2005, or 2000 surpassed the African American population. So demographically speaking, um, if we're just focusing on Spanish, for example, it's definitely prominent within society today. I will be analyzing four different bilingual systems and their subsequent effectiveness. Um, and how they affect the students that are learning in their environments. Um, the first one I will look at is two-way immersion, which deals with students taught um, literacy and content in two different languages. So basically what you'll look at is you'll have half English-speaking students, half Spanish-speaking students, and they'll be put into a classroom together and learn equal parts in Spanish and English. So you kind of have two-way immersion, just two different people, two different groups of learning two different languages. Uh, the other one is traditional bilingual education, and children can which is the theory that children can most easily acquire fluency in a second language by first acquiring fluency in their native language. So obviously the Spanish student comes in, they're going to try to enhance their Spanish skills in order to fully um, be able to translate that into English. Uh, Content-based ESL is when they're focused more on the content um, and don't really worry about the languages, they just do it, focus more on understanding. And then the Socratic method focuses on the depth of understanding and the depth of thought that the students are um, garnering from their education. So. Um, we're going to start with um, the Socratic. So Roger E. Jensen conducted a study on this um, to analyze the effectiveness of the Socratic educative method in creating deeper logical reasoning in bilingual students in an urban city middle school in Nebraska. Um, and at this middle school, uh, in particular, 15% of the student population were ELLs, which, if we remember, means English language learners. The results from this study concluded that, um, so basically he conducted a study that analyzed how they were learning their depth of thought from learning in a foreign language. And it was ranked on one to four, four being um, the highest, or zero to four, with four being the highest they performed, and one, or zero being the lowest. So they started out with an average of 1.38, which obviously isn't that very um, successful with regards to the test, but by the end they had increased upwards of a whole point, which shows that um, increasing the depth of thinking within their educational environment, obviously, 
yields the benefits. Um, also, Esther Somme Gubre is the next one. She conducted a study that analyzed the content based ESL learning method um, in the United States and the Republic of Congo. Um, her study in particular is kind of important, kind of intriguing to me in that it didn't analyze anything to do with Spanish, which is why I picked my topic to begin with, because I'm fluent in Spanish and something that I think is super important. But she did it based on um, immigrant children that came to the U.S. that knew French and Lingala. You can see that um, from the Republic of Congo, where they were from. So they spoke those two languages, but weren't very familiar with English. And so she kind of analyzed how they how they were doing with English when they had two other languages that they were way more familiar with. The data she collected was through daily classroom observations, observation field notes, audio tapes, and interviews. So it was more. Um, it wasn't as much objective data, it was more subjective, based on opinion, based on um, her observations of the children. And what she found was they received very limited exposure to content knowledge within, the, uh, within their educational system because they weren't familiar with the language. And so while content-based ESL does focus a lot on the content, it sometimes loses the actual understanding of what they're learning. But it did find um, benefits that were cultural customs within the educative pedagogy. So they're actually becoming more aware of their cultural heritage and all the students around them also. But again, the content-based ESL didn't really um, give them that depth that Socratic did. Next, we have the Transitional Bilingual Education, which is um, another one that was conducted by Perez and Kennedy and in Los Angeles. United Unified School District, which is the largest school district in California, and obviously has a heavier um, diversity than we do here. The data was collected by the LAUSD student panel. It was an analysis on a change in students' academic achievements between 1997 and 1998 to 1999 and 2000 years. So they're just trying to see growth over time because when you're looking at bilingual education, you can't just look at their um, performance in one year. You have to look at the overall process because it comes to learning as a process. And just as we as students in English environments are learning, um, you, can, you can't just judge some of the growth, the depth of learning. 13 years that we've been in high school. And what they concluded was there's a beneficial effect of placing ELs in the classrooms with more native English speakers. And I believe they're, um, they deduced that based on surrounding yourself with the language, which kind of goes back to the whole um, principle of immersion. When I was a sophomore, I went to an immersion camp in um, Minnesota for Spanish, and it really helped my Spanish skills to be surrounded by a language with which I was a little familiar, but just hearing it and only hearing it really does have um, many benefits to you being able to acquire fluency in the language. And the achievement scores of ELs declined by the switch from bilingual education to English immersion programs, with the exception of grades two to three reading scores. So while I mentioned the benefits of this system, there is obviously some negative effects um, with the aforementioned decline in their test scores and their performance overall. Uh, and the final system I'm going to analyze today deals with, uh, it's called two-way immersion, and this is the one which I side on uh, multiple different levels. I think this one is the best system for uh, American society today, and I think it's the best for the students that will be involved in it. Um, so Elizabeth R. Howard conducted a study to look at the language and literacy development of both native Spanish speakers and native English speakers uh, over time in a multi-dimensional way from a national perspective. So again, we're not looking at just the medical language, we're looking at the English learners that are in that environment too, because it's obviously a little different. Um, in this environment, we all speak English, but if we had half the people that spoke a different language, it would obviously affect us as well, not just them. Um, and her study analyzed capabilities in both languages for both groups by means of statewide testing. So her findings kind of support my um, assertion that two-way immersion really should be the preeminent system that we use. Um, one of the three programs that enable language minority students to reach the 50th percentile in standardized tests so this is one of the programs that did so, so that's why I support it. <clears throat> I conducted a study at Moira, Ruth Moyer Elementary in my hometown of Fort Thomas, Kentucky, and I um, asked the students, they, the, in our school district, each elementary school handles a different sector of society, so that one handles um, bilingual students, and so um, I tapped into that population. There aren't many of them because um, there aren't, there's much diversity in town, but we, I did ask them what language they speak most at school, versus what language they speak most at home, what language they prefer, and what's the hardest part about learning two languages, and what they would change if they could. 
and the results were 60% said they wish they could do more reading, writing, and schoolwork in Spanish, their native language, um, and then 40% said more opportunities to help parents learn English. So a lot of it deals with the familiar process of trying to get their um, families to acquire fluency in English as well, which is a little bit more difficult considering um, a high majority of them are from our first generation children that went to school um, with parents, or the children of immigrants. Also, the hardest part about learning two languages, we had about 25% um, say it's not difficult, so some of them are getting quite confident in their skills in English, but um, then split between 75%, um, which I believe is around 40%, we'll say. Um, the hardest part is between switching between two languages or forgetting words in different languages, so it deals a lot with that switching of the brain into different languages, which can be difficult, especially in previous ages. Also, 60% preferred Spanish, 20% preferred English, and 20% preferred both equally. So we always had someone that was very open to this whole bilingual system and just aren't all liar. Uh, the legislative action that's been taken by the United States is another factor that I think needs to be acknowledged because without um, political and governmental action, you can't really make positive change within uh, the community. So the Bilingual Education Act of 1968 uh, according to Carlos Avandel, the bilingual research journal, marked a significant first step in moving away from the Darwinian sink or swim educational practices that were so prevalent from the 1880s through the 1960s. So with the passage of this act, you also see um, a more sympathetic viewpoint to the bilingual students to help them kind of acquire fluency instead of just saying, here you are in an English environment, good luck. Amendments to the BEA of 1968 included uh, amalgamating instruction in English and in foreign language to one system, um, bilingual programs that were open to English students, which also goes back to that two-way immersion, and giving school districts more autonomy with funding, so they could allocate it where they see it necessary, along with prioritizing bilingual systems and recommitting to their initial goal, which is the overall goal of the BEA, which is to enhance fluency of the English language and cultural awareness within the U.S. Additionally, the No Child Left Behind Act of 2002, um, I'm sure you've seen that a lot on PBS Kids, is No Child Left Behind, it's very prominent it focused solely on English English acquisition, which was why many criticized it, because uh, personally, if you're teaching a child to speak English, you shouldn't make them write everything they know in their own language, because there is no official language in the United States, in case anyone didn't know that, um, even though English is the most prominent. Local common opinions included um, HHS students, a student survey, which 94.4% said that federal funding should be allocated to bilingual educative measures, which is Promising. Some conclusions I made um, thus far is that two-way immersion has dual benefits because you have dual time spent on each language and cultural awareness. You create students that are more accepting of other cultures because they're more exposed to them, and they have a head start in language abilities, which proves that they're uh, which they're assigned to the data proves that they're more likely to be hired because employers really love it when their employees are bilingual because it helps with that global outreach. When you acquire a new language, you don't just learn vocabulary, you learn about that language in the context of a different culture. And that was by Mom Walker Bach also. Or, no, it was by Tom Parisi, there you go. Um, to finish it off, uh, a gap in my research included local coherence because within Fort Thomas, uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 96% of us are Caucasian and 1.4% are Hispanic. So reaching out to that demographic was a challenge, but definitely didn't hinder my findings. Goes back to the lack of problem preeminence in society and my community and the lack of knowledge in the field due to people not experiencing much diversity. Also, the universal applicability is something that should be noted because I focus the majority of my study on the language of which I'm most familiar in English, besides English is Spanish um, and a little French in there. But other languages were largely forgotten. And so the extent to which this study can be applied to different languages is largely um, it's not unknown. Uh, the number of ELLs is growing, so it definitely needs to be more prominent with other languages other than Spanish. Here, so my work cited. Thank you. I'm now ready for your follow-up questions.